This is Campus News, reporting the top stories from colleges and universities. Next on Campus News, students at MSUM make a splash, bringing a board game to life. Cows and sheep at NDSU are teaching students to put their best hoof forward. Some middle schoolers battle to add a trophy to their math achievements. But first, MSUM receives its largest gift in the school's history. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Campus News. I'm Jordan Schreyer. And I'm Ariana Babcock. Minnesota State University Moorhead is naming its School of Business the Paseka School of Business, thanks to a multi-million dollar donation. Reporter Haley Foster tells us how this will be a gift that truly just keeps on giving. It's a historic week on the campus of MSUM. The largest donation ever is coming from longtime friends of the college. On Tuesday, the school revealed that Rodney and Carolyn Pasika are donating $5 million, the largest amount in the university's history. Your incredible generosity will benefit generations of business students by providing scholarships, helping us to attract and retain the best and brightest students. The Rodney and Carolyn Pasika School of Business Endowment will provide support for students, with at least 80% of the money being applied to scholarships. Scholarships not only act as a way to lessen the financial concerns that students face while they obtain a degree, but they also allow students to focus on education. I think it's an understatement to speak on behalf of students that we appreciate what you have given us today. Thank you, Rodney. At the ceremony, Rodney even hinted that this may be the first of many endowments. Uh, this is a remarkable day. You two are a remarkable couple. You make the, me proud to be a dragon, and I'm especially proud, <coughs> excuse me, of being an alumni of the Pasika College of Business. A generous gift that will keep on giving for years to come. Rodney is a longtime MSUM enthusiast participating in the school's very first telethon fundraiser back in the 70s. Thanks, Haley. Sing Our Rivers Red is telling the stories of Native women in harm's way. Haley Warnicke reports how the group spent a week at Fargo-Moorhead College campuses to raise awareness about murdered and missing Indigenous women. I can't. In fact, he can grab me. Sing Our Rivers Red used a self-defense class at Minnesota State University Moorhead to warn about the tragedies facing Native women, violence, murder, and missing women. Being human, it is human to be aware. There's so many different facets to it that in every community the, the response is going to be different and the conversation is going to be different. But we really want people to take it back to their communities and have the conversation that needs to happen there. Some of the women at the Arming Sisters self-defense class have already been attacked. The speaker, Patty Stonefish, is a victim of assault. It doesn't make you any less of a person. It doesn't make you any less human, and I want people to see just how strong they are, regardless of what they've been through. And I want people to walk away with a different perspective on women's self-defense. Uh, it's constantly presented as prevention, but I believe it should be presented as empowerment. I'm going to attack you guys, and you guys need to, you know, get out of it. The self-defense class taught the women how items in their purses can be used as weapons, and their instincts are ways to defend themselves. Never let someone tell you that you should have fought harder. Never let someone tell you that you shouldn't have retreated in your mind. Never let someone tell you how you should have handled that situation. Because you're alive and that's all that matters. Stonefish says the event wasn't only to raise awareness of the missing and murdered Native women, but also a way to show women their empowerment through ways of protecting themselves. With photographer Louis Johnson. I'm not going to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. Haley Warnicke, Campus News. Sing Our Rivers Red hosted other events consisting of a documentary, prayer service, and rally. After receiving recognition from a United States Senator and the Press Club in Washington, D.C., one MSUM film professor is celebrating on her own campus. Friends, family, and colleagues give Kaya Christensen Nelson a round of applause celebrating her recognition as 2014 Minnesota Professor of the Year. MSUM President Ann Blackhurst, a former student and a co-worker, tell the audience why she deserves the recognition. The MSUM graduate started her time at the university majoring in astronomy and physics before majoring in film production. 
Kai Young incorporates real-world experiences in the classroom to give students leadership opportunities. Reporter Louie Johnson caught up with students and faculty to see why a national organization focused on her teaching style. My name is Kaya Christensen Nelson and I've been a professor at Minnesota State University Moorhead since 2006. A film studies professor, Nelson was named 2014's Minnesota Professor of the Year by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. She received the award during a ceremony in Washington, D.C. She is the 11th professor at MSUM to receive the award. We flew out and the very next morning um, woke up and went to Amy Klobuchar's breakfast uh, that they do at the Senator's Hall. I met her and then we went to the National Press Club for a luncheon. There they have the state winners kind of stand and be recognized. Kaya's contribution to our department and to this university is immense. Um, we, we really got lucky when we found her. Nelson is very popular amongst her students for her unique approach to teaching. I really like that Kaya is a very um, hands-on instructor. She's always willing to go out of her way to supply you with things that you need or give you advice to direct you to somebody that'll eventually get you to your goal. She more guides you than kind of um, just like giving you the rules and like hoping that you do okay. Um, it's very easy to come to her and uh, ask her her opinion. She really likes to just let you take your idea, um, let you run with it, let you kind of mold it into what you want to do, and then she'll help you, you know, kind of make it into the best thing that it can possibly be. I'll, I'll never forget the day that Rusty Castleton, who is the guy who started this program, uh, came into my office, and I read the letter, and then I looked at her resume. And I was speechless because it was stellar. And Rusty looked at me and he said, we just won the lottery. With photographer Michaela Fitzgerald, Louis Johnson, Campus News. Kaya is the chair of both the School of Media Arts and Design and the Cinema Arts and Digital Technology Department. A play at Concordia called The Metal Children touches on issues such as teen pregnancy and censorship in schools but how the performance is staged presents challenges of its own. Normally a theater has its audience facing one direction, but in the round at Concordia, the audience is watching from all four sides of the circular stage in the center of the room. The Metal Children is based on the book by Adam Rapp. For freshman theater major Nick Brandt, this completes his second appearance on the Concordia stage. As an audience member, you feel really immersed in it because you're seeing people walk around as if you were just watching people in a room. And so you feel a uh, part of the action as well, which is a really cool aspect of it. The next performance at Concordia is called Blythe Spirit, which will take place April 16th through the 19th. Cow, sheep, and farmers are taking over North Dakota State University. Reporter Tyrell Philly shows us why students at NDSU are saying, holy cow. It's not too often that you see cows roaming a college campus. But every year, the NDSU Saddle and Sirloin Club holds the largest student-sponsored event in the entire state of North Dakota. The Little International is an agricultural jubilee. It features competitions ranging from livestock judging to ham curing. The Little Eye has been a mainstay at NDSU for quite some time. This is the 89th Little Eye. Uh, the math doesn't add up because over World War II, the club was mostly male. A lot of work goes into putting on the Little Eye. Um, I've put a lot of time into this and so has everyone else. The Saddle and Sirloin Club put up over 30 miles of streamers. The club members aren't the only ones working hard. Competitors work tirelessly with their animals to prepare for judging. And they've been working for the past month, day in and day out, trying to get their animals prepared for the show. Saddle and Sirloin says the Little Eye isn't just for those with egg show experience. The nice thing about Little Eye is you don't have to have an egg background. You don't have to have shown anything before. The Little Eye has something to offer for nearly anyone. Young kids get an opportunity to judge some of the competitions, and audiences can win prizes including the best seat in the house. So we'll have our royalty on a stage in the arena, and there'll be a couch there, 
people can buy tickets and if they get the winning ticket they get to sit on the couch all during the show so they're right down in the arena. The Little Eye is a lot of history and hard work packed into just two days. Club members say all the effort is worth it. At the beginning everyone's a little shy but by the end everyone's just really support there to support one another. Year after year, the Saddle and Sirloin Club cultivates a good time at the Little Eye. <laughs> With photographer Nikki Nowin, Tyrell Philly, Campus News. This year's Little International honored North Dakota Agriculturist of the Year, Ray Bartholome. 1M State instructor is getting recognition for his years of work. Reporter Josie Jerezic tells us how since 2004, the educator's been plugging away in the college's diesel technology program. Don't call me, sir. Yes, ma'am. Although he's humble about it, Jim Boehner of M State was selected by Minsky's Board of Trustees to receive one of this year's Outstanding Educator Awards, an honor that seems to have been a long time coming. The diesel technology instructor has been nominated by both students and staff several times prior, but he says it's never something he expected to receive. One time I didn't even bother filling out the paperwork because I didn't think I was worthy of it. But despite each class containing roughly 20 students, he finds a way to connect and joke with each one. I don't think that's too good a night. That's too nice for you. <laughs> you should give it to me. Or communicate well with people of that age, that 18 to 30 year olds. I get along with that age group so well. It's just, it's a, I don't know, I always have. But his love for his work certainly helps. My passion is engines. I love engines and electrical. And I'm the two classes that I was hired to teach and it just was a great fit. Still, he says it's not just about him. Anyone who receives an award, it's really about the department because of what we do. It's not a, I don't consider an individual award, but it's, I'm not going to give it back either, so <laughs> it's pretty neat. Perhaps when it comes to educators like Boehner, he says it best himself. They don't get much better than that, do they? With photographer Alicia Lape, Josie Jerezic, Campus News. Boehner will be honored at a Minskew Board of Trustees luncheon April 22nd in St. Paul. MSUM students are turning their attention to the less fortunate by teaming up with a national organization. Students are partnering with Home Matters, an organization dedicated to providing affordable and sustainable housing. By working together, MSUM and Home Matters hopes to raise awareness and make homes affordable. Their efforts help families in the Fargo-Moorhead community. You can donate by visiting their website, homemattersamerica.com. An NDSU professor is doing his part to help the global issue of world hunger, using pigs. Maddie Jelseth reports on what he is doing to help end this continued problem. <laughs> That's literally what farmers do. It's what we do. We feed the world. World hunger is a continued problem, but the 2050 challenge may help solve this issue. The 2050 challenge, which is talking about the explosive growth of the world population over the next 50 years, essentially, um, leading up to 2050. So whenever we talk about world hunger, we're literally talking about feeding a growing population. Newman is trying to provide people with an abundant amount of meat and food supply. Providing people, again, with a safe, abundant supply of pork, um, one that has um, a positive impact on the environment for the consumer who ultimately will eat it, for the farmer who produces it. He's actually taking these cores and coring out individual muscle fibers. Working in the animal science department, core. Professor Newman wants to help the farmers leave the consumers with an adequate amount of livestock like for so them to eat. Um, I specifically work a lot in the area of pork quality and and what we really are focusing on there is just providing consumers with a great product. But also we work in the area of nutrition, genetics, of animal welfare, um, and producer sustainability because farming is a challenging environment to live within. And a lot of what we do is, is we help develop and test the tools that are going to make feeding the world possible. David Newman says that his whole goal is to end world hunger. Maddie Jalseth, Campus News. Professor Newman also serves as the chairman of the National Pork Board's Domestic Marketing Committee. 
The Math Counts competition brings students together from all across the country to compete. Andy Weston reports how during the regional rounds held at MSUM, a young student found himself saddled with awards. For one student, math is more than just a school requirement. Do a lot of mathematical reading in my spare time. I've got a book here, quantum physics, uh, a lot of mathematics involved. So. After answering the final question correctly in the Regional Math Counts competition, George Pashi from Holly High School was relieved. Although math is the focus of the day's activities, it has been a part of George's life from early on. When I was in first grade, my mom goes, plop fourth grade math book, you need to learn math. Math Counts is a competition designed to bring together students in a friendly setting to challenge themselves and each other intellectually. After a brief lunch break, it was time for the countdown round to begin. The top eight competitors would compete in a lightning round to decide who was the top student of the competition. 57. 57 is correct. Readying himself for the questions ahead wasn't so much about studying as it was just having confidence in himself. Some of the problems are logic, some are just mathematical knowledge, so part of it's intuition. In the end, it was George who walked away victorious. While the prospect of the Nationals still lies ahead, George takes time to appreciate his victory. I'm like, okay, I'll, I got to state last year, so, you know, maybe top four, but yeah, this is awesome. The biggest problem of the day for George wasn't a math problem, but how he would carry all of his awards. Andy Weston, Campus News. Could someone please help me with my kids? The Math Counts State Competitions will be held this month and the National Competition will take place May 7th through the 10th in Boston. The weather was frosty but some MSUM students had dragon fever. Dragon Frost was a week full of festivities showing off Dragon Pride. Some of the events included a Go Pink silent auction, Battleship H2O, tailgating and the women's and men's basketball games. Dragon Frost 2015 is a great success. We had a great turnout for all our events. We've ran out of food every time, so I think that qualifies us as a good event. I believe we also had a lot of good campus involvement throughout, so I think all the students that came, they had a great time, so I would say it's definitely a good success. The university puts on the week-long event to melt away students' winter blues. The Nemzik Pool at MSUM is bringing a childhood board game to life. Reporter, reporter Veronica Utek tells us how Battleship at the university level is more than calling coordinates. You walk in the Nemzik Pool from outside and right away the humidity hits your face. You can hear people cheering on their favorite teams. Everybody is tossing buckets of water into each other's canoes trying to sink their opponent for the Battleship H2O competition. Um, tonight is one of our bigger events. Uh, usually we have like 25 teams. People really enjoy to come play in the water, try to sink their other canoes. Uh, it's a really big competition between a lot of the teams that join. This event seems like a good opportunity to go out on a limb for some students. So I'm just try, excited to try something new. That's always what I've been into, trying new things with new people. I mean, obviously I know these guys, but I'll probably hopefully meet some people on the other team. Maybe share some laughs with the people, even if we don't come in exact close contact. But hopefully it'll be fun, and hopefully we win. New people and new skills are needed for tonight's event. Well, we just kind of put the team together last minute, so we prepared mentally by just talking about our game plan of staying low in the canoe and just getting after it, every other team. And then we kind of made treaties out there, and it was, it was a good time. Some competitors came tonight with a bit more of a plan. We had a coach. And he had all this stuff drawn up and we had a game plan. And it didn't go according to plan where they put us in the field, but we had certain plays written up too. But they didn't really mean much, but they sounded cool. Fun times seemed very evident that night at Nemzik Pool. And next year, there will be definitely more splishing, splashing, and sinking. With photographer Jared Schumacher, Veronica Utah, Campus News. Battleship H2O was a part of week-long festivities celebrating Dragon Frost. And now we turn it over to Shaylee Meyer for a look at this week's sports. Shaylee, MSUM's men's basketball is claiming another top spot in the region. Yeah, their hard work is still paying off this season. 
The NCAA tournament is just around the corner and the Division II men's rankings are released. MSUM is now ranked number two in the Central Region rankings. The top eight teams from the area will advance to the regional round of the NCAA tournament. The Dragons have set the school record for the most wins and three-pointers made in a season. They also had the best start in school history beginning the season with a record of 25-1. and The top seed Augustana will host the NCAA tournament on March 14th, 15th, and 17th. Minnesota Governor Mark Dayton has added his name to a letter in defense of University of Minnesota Duluth women's hockey coach Shannon Miller. Miller was unexpectedly told that she is being let go by the university. That prompted 13 state senators to send a letter to the U of M president and the chancellor of the University of Minnesota Duluth. The letter expresses their concerns about her dismissal. The school says the decision was difficult but based on finances. Miller is the highest paid coach in Division I women's hockey. However, UMD's men's head coach, Scott Sandlin, is paid more while producing a lower winning percentage. Miller has hired lawyers specializing in Title IX cases, which prohibits discrimination based on gender in any educational setting. One NDSU basketball player is scoring points and breaking records. Reporter Turner Blaufus tells us how the player is getting recognition for his athletic achievements. Lawrence Alexander is in his fourth year in the green and gold, and he admitted his time has flown by. In Alexander's career as a bison, the pedal to the metal guard has racked up numerous accolades, but was surprised to be named to the Lou Henson watch list. It's actually pretty neat, uh, to be honest. Uh, I didn't know I was actually named to the list until I seen on Twitter. So, but uh, overall, I think it's just, uh, it's pretty neat. With a new coach at the helm after three years under Saul Phillips, Alexander has flourished under first-year coach David Richmond. Alexander and his teammates have carried on last season's success and we're glad to have a familiar face on the bench. It's just, it's just been the same, honestly. Um, it's kind of what I expected out of Dave, you know. I think it's been pretty smooth. Lawrence and I have always had a tremendous relationship and it's been, you know, a, a real blessing for me to have someone like him around and make this transition for me a lot easier as well. Alexander is the top scorer in the Summit with 19 points per game and the high octane guard is also leading the conference in minutes played. Alexander is averaging a whopping 38.6 minutes a game. The lone Bison senior is shooting 44% from behind the arc and nailed a school record eight three-pointers against the University of South Dakota. A part of his game, Alexander said, he has strived to improve. I really like getting to the basket, but uh, my, my numbers might show otherwise, and I'm shooting better from the three-point than I'm doing the field. With the Bison heading into the Summit League tournament with one of the top two seeds guaranteed, Alexander hopes to repeat last year's success and make the trip back to the big dance. Back to the NCAA tournament, if you ask me, um, that's one of our goals this year. With photographer Meg Keim, Turner Blafus, Campus News Sports. Alexander has been the Summit League Player of the Week four times this season. The Bison will head to the Summit League Tournament in Sioux Falls, South Dakota on March 7th through the 10th. A former NDSU softball player is representing her alma mater and her nation in a big way on the field. Former Bison shortstop Nicole Rivera is one of 18 athletes named to the national women's baseball team. The team will compete in the first ever Pan American Games qualifier for the sport. Teams will meet in the Dominican Republic from March 8th through the 15th. The top four teams will advance to the Pan American Games in Toronto. Rivera earned her spot on the team through an exemplary college career, including a 313 batting average, three home runs, and 55 RBIs. She also ranks third all-time in stolen bases and stolen base attempts. Progress is being made on the new outdoor field at MSU Moorhead, and the athletic department is fired up for the design process to kick off. Last week, MSUM Athletic Director Doug Peters announced the company Field Turf was selected as the vendor for Shields Field. The new turf would replace the natural grass that the Dragons are currently using at Alec Nemzik Stadium. The hope is artificial turf would hold up better than the grass, especially during bad weather. The next step is to continue working on the field's design. So now it's the fun part. It's picking the design of the field. And obviously with artificial turf, you can do a lot of different things. You can do different colors. You can do different schematics on it. Fans can visit the Dragons football website to give their design input. Funding for the field was raised during laps for the long run, where Shields CEO Steve Shield donated $1 million. I think it'll be really interesting to see what colors they choose. I hear they're looking at black and red. 
Yeah, but I'm just glad they're just going to be getting new turf this year. It's going to be really awesome. Thanks, Shaylee. Libraries are a staple at universities around the world, but many wonder if students even use them. I did some investigating to see if students are giving more than lip service to their university libraries. When most students think about what happens in their libraries, you'll hear a lot of self-loathing. A lot of boring study sessions. <laughs> Deep thought about the world. In libraries, it's a lot of people sitting around reading, studying, pretending to study and not actually doing any work. But a Canadian university in New Brunswick is showcasing its library for different reasons. The university released a promotional video that shows students swapping spit instead of notes in the library. It's a strange thing to include in a video trying to promote your school. And that has some wondering if that's happened at MSUM. I don't even want to know what's going on because I'm sure not all of it's studying. Library staff say not to worry. I've been wild like that, not here anyways. On the West Coast, it's a different story. An Oregon State University student was cited for public indecency after school officials learned an adult film was made in their house of knowledge. Education is very important. I'm not sure how that happens. Because I feel like libraries are well lit and there's lots of movement and people there. Why? Like why? I'm, I'm trying to process through why you would make an adult film in a library. But it seems all the publicity may be working. Maybe I don't go to the right library. While some students are taking sex education too far at MSUM's library, you only need to be worried about students taking a sleep study too far. The Oregon student could face up to one year in jail and a $6,000 fine for her adult production. And that's it for this edition of Campus News. We leave you with a look at MSUM's Battleship H2O. Thanks for joining us and have a great week. Campus News is produced by the Television News Workshop in the School of Communication and Journalism at Minnesota State University, Morgan, in cooperation with Prairie Public Television.